We have a few, oh, there's another one. Better not forget about that guy. So let's mark up this a little bit. Oh, that's a small one. I want that, I want that. So we're solving for those two. Uh-oh, right. oh yeah. All right, solving for all that. Some of these, so dy, dx, dy, dx, those two terms, we're going to say they're 0. We're looking for how do things change in the x direction. So we're saying don't care about no change in the y direction. So we're going to say that dy, dx are 0. So we're looking for the partial. So any questions on why we're going to cross out the dy, dx's? We're saying I don't want change in that direction. So that they're all going to be 0. So let's cross out those terms. So that's going to be 0, which will cancel that entire term right there. The other one is this dy dx going to be 0, canceling out that entire term. So I'm going to rewrite the slightly smaller version next to it. And then we're going to algebraically solve <coughs> for dz dx and see what we get. Unfortunately, it's going to be difficult. All right, so we get 3x squared plus that is the next term. y e to the x z times z plus x. I'm going to use z prime to mean dz dx. So there's only one derivative now. I'm tossing out the d dy part. So I'm just going to use x prime for our derivative here. So we got x, or sorry, z prime. z prime. That was the end of the parentheses. That's a bad parenthesis. Plus z prime cos y. Cos y minus 0 equals 0. What about that 2z? Uh oh. 2. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot that one. So plus 2z, z prime. Yeah, absolutely. And we will just slide the 0 over. Equals 0 part. All right, definitely would not have had a chance of getting the right thing without that. So I've talked about DSFD way back in Calc 1. It's really just do algebra to solve for z prime. So distribute something, subtract an F word, factor, factor yes. Divide. All right, I think this procedure will work right here. So expand or distribute everything out. Subtract everything that's not z prime out of here. And then factor and divide. So go ahead and do those steps right now.
is the, yeah, the first one is the one we're looking at. We did the, the not the y derivative, but the with respect to x derivative. Just put the negative out of the numerator of that one right there, the exact the same. Yep. All right, so that worked. Now, usually things in math work out analogously, so I'm pretty sure I could do something really similar to get dz dy right there. So this is a very good time to talk about partial derivatives versus regular ones. I did switch from partial, from a full derivative to a regular derivative when I said forget about all that y changey stuff. So when I set d y dx equal to 0, I switch from being a full derivative to a partial. So this last line here, I really should be writing these are partials. So I switched to partials because I threw away all the change in every other direction. I said, I only care about x direction change. I don't care about y or anything else. So when I throw that out, that's when I switch into partials. Any questions on these two being similar? So you should be very happy to find out that I extended some homework dates and I added a bunch of problems to this section here in chain rule. You should be. It's more practice. Better Hopefully better sure. scores. So you can use, so what I showed you is you can use implicit differentiation to find partial derivatives if you want to. So there are at least two ways you can now go about getting these partial derivatives. You can get the regular derivative and then sort of zero out all the other directions and then solve. Or you can use a shortcut method, which is what I used yesterday because I didn't know what I was doing temporarily. So not everything works out like it should. Sometimes it does and you get lucky. A lot of times it doesn't. That's why movies are pretty much a waste because you know who's going to win. Unless you have good old movies where Hannibal Lecter fades into the crowd at the end. And then the movie, that's the end. I think that's Silence of the Lambs. Is that right? I don't know. I like when bad guys win. Good guys winning is overrated. All right, that's why I don't really like superhero movies very much. Not a surprise what's going to happen. All right, we are done. That was a good time to finish chapter 14. So you're going to come back to 14 later in Calc 4. We are going to go on to 15 right now. Oh, there was one more homework problem that talks about the differential. I want to talk about that for a minute. It's not very difficult. I think there's only one homework problem on it. So if you just have a little d, no d, dx, d, d, anything else. You've used this before. So we'll start with something easy, like x equals cos theta. And I'm going to Take the differential of this. That's all the differential operator does in two variables. Basically, your u substitution, use this. And you could, let's see, normally we would have written, you could divide out by this. Could have written this as dx d theta equals. So you can change this around like it's a fraction. Uh, one question that I added was a differential operator on an equation with three variables. So here we go. We'll do so. There's our first example right there. Our, this will be the real last example. This acts a lot like implicit differentiation. So let's do the right side first. That'll be easy. 
What's the derivative of z squared? 2z, and we get an extra dz at the end. What rule do I need to do on the left side? Product rule. So we got x times y. There's a product happening. So what's the derivative of x? Dx. It's going to be 1 dx. So we have dx times y plus x times dy. So that's how it works in uh, multiple three or more. It just works like that. And you can solve, you could uh, divide everything by dx if you wanted to, or dy or dz for that matter. Whenever you see, whenever you see dx, dy, or dz, this is not multiplication. So you can't split it apart. So it would be very bad to write it like 2z, z, d, like that. You can't just reorder it around. So you have to think of these like they are single units right here. You can't break them apart. So all those are together. If you want, you can divide by them, but you have to divide everything by dz. You can't divide just by a d or just by a z. You have to divide by the whole dz part. So we just spent a whole chapter or half a chapter on derivatives. So now we're going to spend half a chapter on integrals or antiderivatives. So the easiest region we're going to integrate, well, I think we're just going to integrate over rectangles the whole time, I'm pretty sure. Is that right? Nope, that's not true. We'll be switching very quickly. Oh, and then we'll go to polar regions. Nice. All right. So I'll start out over rectangles. So region. Did I define region already? I think I did. I don't want to redefine it. This is an example of a region. I'm pretty sure I defined it already. Probably 14.1. For example, sets. Bounded region. I didn't say region. What does your book say for region? I'm assuming it's going to be a subset of n-dimensional space. But I don't want to define it wrong. Now, we certainly talked about open sets, closed sets, interior points, boundaries, all that fun stuff. Should be an index in the back. Hopefully, it's only on one or two pages. Region. So we'll use S.
there's several options. We have founded, closed, connected, general, double, and real program. How about general? So we talked about bounded and closed already and open. I'm assuming it's probably just a subset of Rn. They may not even define it. All right, so we'll take subset of Rn to be our definition. All right, I can see without uh, looking very carefully, the first part of this set tells me it's points in two dimensional space. So it's already a region. This is some points in R2 such that x is between A and B and y is between C and D. There's another way to write, well, there's lots of ways to write this. I could write it as x is between or in the closed interval AB, y is in the closed interval C. D. So the second way should make sense. There's not really changing very much. The third way is looking a little weird, though. The third way, so this is a subset of R times R which of course is r squared. So it's a subset of r times r. We can draw it out pretty easily. Here's r squared. Wherever c and d are, or a and b are the x values. So we look at the closed interval from a to b. And it's a little weird. The closed interval from c to d is actually a y interval. And if we multiply these two together, what that means is every x <coughs> between a and b and every y between c and d. So when you multiply them or take their cross product, I shouldn't say it's not cross product, their Cartesian product, oh, Cartesian product, this is our set S right here. So any questions on this? last representation. Now I assume they were in quadrant, everything was positive, but something could be negative and this rectangle could move to different quadrants. So we're going to consider that region and now a surface over S. And <coughs> do our best to draw this out. So S is a rectangular region. You can draw that as a parallelogram on the floor or the z equals 0 plane. And now we're considering a surface over top of this. So there is some height function. Not quite over top, but sort of over top. What we're going to do is try to get the volume of this shape that I just drew. try to find the volume of this solid. So are there any questions before we actually get into how are we going to find this? Any questions about the solid shape that I'm talking about? It's not quite a rectangular cube because the top has some curve to it, but <coughs> it's close to a rectangular cube. Now I drew a function that wasn't a surface that was relatively level. Your surface could go crazy. It might be some huge uh, increase going on. So it could be very, very far away from being an actual close to a rectangular block. How do we go about finding this volume? 
What are some ways we can estimate? So we're going to break it into small pieces. So this picture, it might make sense to cut it horizontally. But the way we're actually going to break it up is we're going to cut the bottom up like this. So we have some going that way and that way. And what we're going to do is focus on one of these at a time and then get the volume above one of those little squares. Would that be area? Or is it the well, yeah, it's the 3D part, which I didn't want to draw here because I want to clutter it up, yeah. Okay. Oh, let's use the pink marker, perfect. And I'll use the thin one here. Oh, that's not the thin one. So we'll say it looks like this up there, and then, oh. This is why I didn't really want to do it. <laughs> that really horribly drawn region right there. I feel like calling this a splinter. So it's just a little cut out piece going down. Splinter is a good, good enough word. <laughs> and what are we going to do when we estimate each of these? Take an integral? That's what we'll do eventually. So yeah, we add them up. Okay. So however. Let's say I cut in 36 pieces approximately. We'll add up all the pieces together, and that will be close to the volume. And then what we're going to do, we are going to eventually turn it into a limit, but we're going to take it to be infinitely small pieces. And then the limit of that will be the integral once we break it into arbitrarily small pieces. So let's do this very carefully. So we're going to get the volume of this one splinter right here. Good idea. All right, so we're estimating volume. So estimate the volume. So what I need, I'll draw it slightly larger. So there's the base right there. The height, I won't draw it quite so tall. So it looks a little bit nicer. Now, the height is not perfectly flat. However, if I cut it into en small enough pieces, the height won't change that much. So even if it's really steep, if I cut it into tiny pieces, each little piece will only get a little bit different in height. So I have to decide, where do I want to get the height from? Because they'll all be relatively close when you make it small, let's just go for the bottom left corner. We'll use the height whatever it is at the bottom left corner, just arbitrarily chosen. I think any of the four corners are reasonable to use. I'm just going to go bottom left. You could, if you really wanted to, average the four points together and go middle. But once you take your limit, it won't matter which way you go. So I'm just going to go bottom left. So I need coordinates right here. We'll call this xi comma yi. So that's the point right there. How do I get the height? Where did the surface come from? So a surface, the z equals, so we need some function that takes x and y and gives us some height right here. So we have our height is f of, in this case, xi, yi. That's our height. So we're going to take that xy point that we got, we call it xi, yi, and we're going to plug it into f. And f will tell us how high up. Or it, I drew it as positive. It could very well be negative, in which case you get a negative volume. 
So we have height right here. So what does the volume look like? Oh, I need a measurement. There's two other measurements I need. They're looking like this. Uh, generally, you would you want to go usually big minus small. So if it was negative, I'd be doing sort of the absolute value of f or big minus small. So I need this right here. We'll call this delta x, and we'll call this amount delta y. That's how much you're going to move over for each rectangle right there. So vi, the volume of the ith rectangle, is height times delta x times delta y. So there's vi right there. So total volume, this is our estimate, so we're going to use a squiggle equals. We have to add up all of these vi's uh, from i equals 1 to some big number. Tempted to just use capital N right here. So in, in our case here, there's, let's say, about 36 of them. 35, however many I drew. So it'll be 35, we have to add them all together. And that's the estimation. The limit of this as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, so this will be equal now. It's no longer an approximation because we're breaking it into infinite number of rectangles or subdivision. This turns into the integral fxy dx dy, and we have to be very careful about our region. So normally, you would say a to b. That's not going to work anymore, though. Well, is a and b, is that x or y? You're going to be doing, you need both values. So the way I'm going to write it, like this. That's our rectangular region. X goes from A to B. Y goes C to D. So it turns out there is two ways to actually write this. Uh, I probably should do a double integral sign here. So when you actually go to compute this, there is two ways to do so. I'm going to insert a order of operations right here. Inside the parentheses, we're doing an x antiderivative. So what values do I need for, these are both x values right there. What x values do I need? So, could scroll way up to here, but I need a and b. So x's are all, when you write a, a b cross c d, it goes x first, y second. So we're going to go a to b. When you're done with that integral, you'll get something. You're going to integrate that a second time with respect to y. And here's where you use c, y equals c to y equals d. <coughs> 
So just like two derivatives in a row, you do this inside derivative or the close derivative first. In this case, it's the close antiderivative. And then you do the further out antiderivative. So it works in a similar way. You're doing two antiderivatives. You just have to do them in the right order. There's another way to write this. You could switch the xy order. So in this case, we have x equals a to x equals b, y equals c to y equals d. What else needs to change? The yeah, so we're going to have y endpoints. We have to go dy first, dx second. Now you're generally not going to see the blue brackets or parentheses in there. Uh, the answer is some, it matters sometimes. We'll get more into that. For a rectangular region, it does not matter. So do you assume the other variables are constant when you're integrating? Yes. So if I see, in the first example, I'm going to do an x antiderivative. So I'm assuming y is just a letter or just a constant. Yeah. So they're generally going to be equal when things are nice. And certainly when you're in a rectangular region, they're going to be the same. So here's two choices for volume of a rectangular region, of a surface over a rectangular region. So one thing I didn't show you is why the infinite limit turns into the integral. So I think that's one of the things that would be useful to talk about at the end of this quarter, if we have extra time. I think it's time to do an example. So I'll do the inside integral, and then you'll do the outside integral. I'm just going to go x, y. doesn't matter what order you do it on these problems. So I'm going to 100 minus 6x squared y. I'm going to go alphabetical dx, dy. So that dictates I have my x's first, my y's second. So my x goes 0 to 2, my y's negative 1 to 1. You don't have to keep writing x equals y equals everywhere. You should know that in here, that's all x's. So I'm not writing x equals 0, x equals 2 on these. You just know it's a dx integral, so we're doing x's. And you can group it up like this. So inside, I'm doing an antiderivative with respect to x. So what's the antiderivative of 100 with respect to x? 100x. So you want something that has a derivative, that would be 100. So it's 100x. And the other one's a little more complicated. We have an x squared. So I'm going to add 1 to the power. 
and I like to guess and check. So I took the x squared, add a 1 to the power, and I have to divide by the new power. For x, yeah, but I'm, and I'm taking the antiderivative right now. So don't worry about the bounds yet. Antiderivative questions. I think this is your first anti partial antiderivative. It's a lot like the antiderivative, or the regular partial derivative, except it's <coughs> backwards. So 6 and the y are constant. So I'm really just anti-differentiating the x squared part. Now, what about the endpoints? They still are around. I just didn't write them. So we write that little vertical bar right there, 0 to 2. Oh, and I still have a dy. Don't forget about that. So I'm just doing the inside part first. Make sure when you plug in 2, you're plugging in for x's. Don't plug in 2 for y's. It's very tempting to plug into the wrong variable. So that 2 is an x value, not a y value. So do not plug that in for any of the y's. We took an x antiderivative. It might be a good idea to write explicitly these are x's. So we got 200 minus something 6 times 9 y minus, we should get 0 minus 0. So I just took, oh no, that's not a 9. So 6 times 8 over 3y. 16, 16y. So you finish. Are there any questions on this step? All I did was plug in 2 for x. 2 cubed is 8. And then luckily we got 0, 0 for our last when we subtracted. That won't always happen. Don't assume that it's always going to be 0. Make sure you actually plug it in and see this is going to be 0. All right, I want you to do the antiderivative with y now. So it's just a regular antiderivative. You don't even need substitution or anything. Just integrate it. It's with respect to y now, so you shouldn't get any x's. Questions on any of this calculus or <coughs> arithmetic? Your H should have canceled. It, it is, yeah. And then it cancels that the first 8 was a negative 8.
So there's another way to get volumes. We're going to look at the other way to do it. So I will draw out the uh, the same attempt to draw out the same region. We had that rectangular base. And then some surface function on top, like that. So there's another way to get this volume. What if we just cut it one way? So this looks like a loaf of bread, basically. So we're slicing it up like this. So we're doing cross sections. If this is our x-axis and y-axis. This would be cross sections uh, with our, each one of these guys will be delta x right here. And let's look at what this turns into. So obviously we're going to look at one cross section at a time. So I'll just draw one cross section out. So it's going to look like that right there. So we got our one cross section. So one issue is, what do you notice about the height of this cross section? No matter how thin I made them, it still has a curve to it. So I can't assume the height is constant. Well, I can't assume the height in the height in this direction is not constant. If I make them thin enough, I can ignore the height change in this direction. So if I slice them super thin, I could ignore the height change in that thin direction. So we need to stop here, and we will come back and finish this off.